I would say that China is largely included in the institutions and initiatives that uh, influence the global economic order. If you look at the G20, where China is now chairing it this year, if you look at the World Trade Organization, where China has become increasingly active, and if you even look at the IMF and the World Bank, where China has been quite vocal about the problems of emerging economies being underrepresented in terms of their voting power, you are seeing China actively engaged. And I think there is a lot of influence that can be delivered through that kind of engagement. If you look at China from the regional perspective, and I think regional trade can also have a major impact on the international economic system, you see China actively uh, trying to negotiate and successfully negotiating free trade agreements and other kinds of initiatives and being involved in APEC and taking those kinds of, of uh, stances. And we also, I think, have to look at other kinds of initiatives, like, for example, the climate change initiative. Even though that was not billed as an economic initiative, it certainly has major economic impact. And I think China has shown itself to be very actively engaged in that. Now, there are exceptions. So if we think about it, um, if you start, for example, with the uh, uh, the WTO institutions, the trade institutions, China has been actively involved not only in the World Trade Organization, but also in some plurilateral negotiations that have been uh, going on uh, from the information technology agreement to the environmental goods agreement, which is currently under negotiation. But it has not been involved in the trade and services uh, negotiations. And I think that comes from the fact that I'm not sure that it is clear that China actually is in a position to actually meet the ambitious standards of the agreement and to open its services markets really widely and undertake disciplines on protectionist measures and do all of that by the end of 2016. When it comes to the regional world of trade, of course, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is something that is on everyone's minds. But again, I think it's an issue of China probably not being ready at this point to be able to take on disciplines on state-owned enterprises, the labor rights, perhaps some of the rule of law and transparency issues, and other problems for China in actually meeting those standards. Now, if we turn to the IMF and the World Bank, which is not an area that is my area of expertise by any means, I must say I think that does pose different issues and seems to have some problems of institutional, I'll call them rigidities, that, uh, that China and others are trying to uh, grapple with. I think China comes to the table with some suspicions about the current uh, global economic infrastructure. To some extent, this comes from the fact that China will say that the rules were made for some of the core institutions after World War II when China was not participating. So not only was there no China input, but it's not clear to China that the rules then necessarily would reflect China's interests uh, as opposed to the interests of the powers that uh, created those rules. I think there's also a suspicion in China, and I don't believe that it's well-founded, but I think it may be deeply rooted, that the United States is trying to keep China down. And as a result, any initiatives that the United States is taking will be looked at with very great suspicion by China. Um, I think that's unfortunate because there are, there are lots of opportunities, I think, for important collaborations between uh, our two countries, but that, that is the way it is. Um, I also think that um, China is going to be obviously interested in pursuing its own self-interest, every country is, but one question for China is a question that a lot of countries have to grapple with, and that is to what extent does its national interest include an interest in having multilateral institutions or initiatives succeed? Even if the direct impact of the initiative might be to benefit others, not China, directly or in the short run, if it turns out that it creates more stability in the system, and therefore promises benefits to China that are either indirect or in the long run. And I think China probably has a number of voices inside its system that have a varying uh, set of perspectives on that.
when we take those principles and we think about the particular institutions, I think with regard to the IMF and the World Bank, for example, I think China is demonstrating that it wants to learn the system and then understand what the advantages are to it in the system and then adjust the system accordingly. So that's quite a methodical and an evolutionary approach as opposed to China wanting to make revolution. So I think China has made it its, its, um, its motivations clear, which is to say that the emerging economies should be given a fairer share in these institutions reflective of their strength in the global economy. So that is not a selfish or uh, unreasonable position to be taking. And so I think China's efforts to, to take that stance show that it is actually trying to work within the institution. I think the IMF is, and the World Bank are also very effective in terms of their technical expertise, and I don't think China would want to blow them up uh, given the kind of expertise that they offer to the world and the potential stability. And they also do offer China an effective international platform for making criticisms, whether it's of the financial crisis and the developed countries' roles in that or China's current concerns uh, about the underrepresentation of emerging economies. At the same time, of course, China has also uh, put out uh, notice via both the BRICS Bank and the um, Asia um, Bank that the Asia, the A. IIB, um, that it is not going to sit on its hands if it turns out that the status quo powers are not going to be listening to it. And so I think this greater assertiveness is uh, a mark of China's greater confidence and its sense that there are actions that it can and wants to take that are in its self-interest. When we look at the World Trade Organization and the trade environment generally, I think we're looking at a slightly different picture. I think it's absolutely without question that China has benefited strikingly from uh, joining the World Trade Organization and its economic development is enhanced by the rules and disciplines of the WTO. I think it's also very clear that China gains from open markets abroad, both to export its goods and services and to allow it to import the things that it needs. So I don't see China making massive changes to the World Trade Organization because of these benefits. At the same time, I do see China uh, taking steps to slow down uh, efforts in any of the international trade organizations to impose disciplines that may feel to China like they conflict with China's political goals. They may be very good for China economically, but that doesn't mean that China is necessarily going to do what's rational for it in the economic long term. It has political issues too. I think um, questions like state-owned enterprises uh, offer an example here where disciplines in any of the WTO institutions or other trading agreements, including, for example, TPP, may be hard for China to swallow as much as that would be good for China in economist terms. I also think that China is becoming more assertive about trying to find ways in the international trading institutions to assert its own interests and gain advantage. So I think you it's not just defensive to keep them from having to take on obligations, but I think it's offensive to try to set up standards or rules that will benefit China. And I think you see this now increasingly interestingly in what would otherwise be considered a very technical area, which is standards organizations. If China can get its standards for its products and services, um, put into the international system, then it will gain an advantage over the other international players. One, I think it was an opportunity for China to show its leadership in the region, to show that China was capable and to do something that was constructive for the rest of that region. It also obviously uh, was a very pointed commentary uh, with regard to the other institutions that were offering uh, financial aid uh, to the world. 
uh, including the IMF, the World Bank, and probably the Asian Development Bank. So China is trying to make a statement that it is not to be under uh, appreciated and that it is not going to sit on its hands if it turns out that the institutions are moving too slowly to be able to take steps that China believes are constructive. Now, it's also obvious, I think, that setting up the AIIB will put China in a position where it stands to benefit. Short term, its economy will benefit in terms of jobs and in terms of inflow of money, probably from infrastructure projects, because China is extremely efficient in these areas and therefore will do very nicely. And then, of course, in the longer term, it will gain the infrastructure, which will assist it in its economic relations with these countries. And it will also gain, hopefully, both stability and uh, economic growth for itself and others through the improved economic conditions in the other countries. If I look at the question of what else China is likely to be doing from the trade system perspective, I feel that China is going to probably be looking at the angles. So China is not going to try to dismantle a system that allows its goods and services to flow across borders freely and allows it to obtain goods and services that it needs. It's not going to want to do that. It's too big a player in this system. But I don't think China necessarily believes that everyone should just stop with a level playing field. I think China is interested in finding the angles of advantage beyond that level playing field. So I think China is constantly thinking about what it can do to ensure that the system is maximizing a number of things for China. One of them is um, economic advantage to Chinese stakeholders, reduced costs for Chinese stakeholders, uh, national prestige for China, and probably, very importantly, control. So China's interest in control over its economy and its environment is at odds with the multilateral system and is at odds with what some economists believe is necessary in order to, for example, innovate or in order to really develop fully as an economy. And I think China is going to be constantly looking for the ways that it can meet its needs um, through the international trading system. So it will be defensive in some of the WTO kinds of uh, venues or some of the plurilateral venues. I think that may explain why um, there is concern about China wanting to join open negotiations. Will it come in with an effort to put a break on the negotiations as opposed to wanting to actually be create a cutting edge kind of system? I think it's also the sort of thing where China, for example, with regards to standard setting and technical organizations, is going to be increasingly asserting its interest because it sees that these are opportunities for it to gain long-term economic advantage for its, its stakeholders. And similarly, I think China is looking hard at areas like intellectual property rights and various other forms of assets where it is seeing right now that others in the world have more of these assets. So what are the ways that China can gain these assets? Does it mean China will create new rules that will try to pry these assets out of others' hands? Will it create more restrictive IP licensing rules? Will it try to leverage access to its market? Uh, what will it do? And because China's rule of law is not the most mature, I think we will potentially see China working these angles using what would be considered to be gaps in the international legal system, but also potentially things that may stray across the line in terms of international legality from time to time. China is definitely shaping the global economic order. 
it is shaping it by its very presence in the system. And it has shaped it by its willingness to participate in the multilateral system and open itself up to the extent it has. It is going to shape the global economic system going forward based on a combination of its foreign policy goals, its own internal need and desire for stability, and its need for economic development. And I think that those goals are going to potentially be sometimes at odds with each other. I should also mention that I think China's sense that it needs to be viewed as a respected and central figure in the world includes that need in the international economic order. And I think that will drive China towards trying to take statesmanlike actions. But China will never forget its self-interest. And China is, let me put it this way, China drives a very hard bargain. Mm -hmm.